Thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I wish it was lunchtime, but it's just past breakfast here in Boston. So uh, this is work together with uh, Jordan Wick and Unami O'Reilly, and uh, it's about getting a head start on programming synthesis, genetic programming. So what we're uh, what we're dealing with there is that. It is possible to learn programming on your own, but if you follow it in a course with a teacher, it could make the learning easier because the teacher often gives their students a head start by introducing examples of problems related to the problem that you try to deal with at hand. And they can also provide a solution that a student only needs to extend or refactor. So this idea of moving from one problem to a related one is conceptually similar to multitask learning and curriculum learning, for example. And GP can run and solve multiple, can within the run solve multiple similar programs. So we're looking at only change the input and output requirements and also trying to prime the population with some solutions similar to the target problems. So we would like to see if we can reduce the reliance on manual intervention, external libraries or restarts. So what we're interested in here is to how we can give this head start to GP. Because uh, uh, the, we have instructor programs that are ready for modification that can see the GP's initial population. So these would give starting points for GP closer to a solution to the problem we're trying to solve. And we could also try to provide elements of some kind of curriculum for programming. So you could learn one problem and then the other, or maybe learn, try to learn both problems simultaneously. So for this, we use, we've looked at two similar Python programming problems from a course called MIT X6001.1 X Introduction to Computer Science and Programming in Python, which is a MOOC offered on the edX platform. So to the right here, we can see we have the first problem It's called count vowels, or we could call it short P1. Basically you get a string and then you wanna count how many vowels there are in the string. So it consists of a loop and a conditional statement. This, so this was the first problem given in this course. The second problem in this course is count Bob. We call that P2, which is you're given a string. And now you want to count how many times the string, uh, string Bob occurs in that string. So again, it's very similar to count Bob's. And finally, we created a combo problem, which we called combo. So that's where we're trying to solve both count vowels and count Bob at the same time. So we're giving a string and we want to return how many vowels and how many Bob is occurring. So to do this, we modify a grammatical GP system. We're using Pony GE2 to solve multiple programming problems in one run. And so we then need a schedule so we can change one programming problem to another by just changing the input output examples. And we also look at initializing population with existing solutions to a programming problem. And we do that the normal GPM way with just random programs. We have human coded solutions to these, pro to these problems. And then we also look at programs generated from previous GP runs. So in this paper, we're interested in the research questions here is that how can the quality of a solution change when GP switches the problem in the within the run to a similar problem? And how does the quality of a solution change when we have a GP population initialized with solutions to a similar problem? So to look at the method really briefly, we at the top here, we have the algorithm for a GP. We do it very similar. We just initialize with the system problems at the key thing. And then on line seven, we can also switch the programming problem, switch a, pro, switch a problem that we're using. On the bottom here, we're showing a sketch of grammatical evolution. It basically says that we provide a BNF grammar that we parse, and then we have integer input sequences that we map via this context-free grammar to an output sentence that we then evaluate in our interpreter. The fitness values is sent, then sent back to the evolution algorithm. To the right here is the schematic of how do we do this? Uh, how do we change the programming problems? Well, we start with some problem Q1 and then later on we switch to Q2. We could do Q1 and Q2 at the same time, or we could also look at first Q1 and then we try to solve Q1 and Q2. The ones below show different types of initialization. So then the setup we're looking at here is again, we're, we're <clears throat> we have 200 generations, quite a large population size of 800. The, we're using PyGrow initialization, and we're also using this 
novelty selection concepts that <clears throat> that was introduced where you you we don't always use fitness for selection sometimes we use the novelty of a program for selection to the right is the grammar that we were using so that this grammar can solve all, all the problems that we set up and then below here are the different variants so we tried the, the, we tried different times when in the run we should change between the problems. We could do it early, mid, or later on, as in 25, 50%, or 75%. And then we have that we can go from first trying to solve problem one, switch to problem two, go from problem one trying to solve both of them in the combo, or start with problem two and switch to problem one, or start with problem two and switch to combo. And we also have some other initialization schemes. So the results that we're going to focus on here is that first, we see the baseline, which are we don't do any switching. We try to solve problem one all the time. And when we do that, that gives us the best. So we solve it 97 times out of 100. We solve all, solve all the outer sample test cases. Then, but for P2, when we do the early switch, so we first try to solve problem one and then switch to P2. That's when we solve the most. And when we try to solve both, we start by starting with problem two first and then trying to solve problem two and problem one. Uh, when you do that later on, that gives the best performance. So if you look at it a bit more, what happens during the run for one of them, we're just gonna look at the details for the combo problem, as in when we're trying to solve problem one and problem two at the same time. So to the left here, we have the generations on the x-axis and the y-axis is the ratio, is, in a, is the percentage of times we solve all the other sample test cases. And these lines just show how the baseline is performing. So the top one is when we solve only P1, uh, P2, and when we solve the combo. To the right, we've done a shift of the graph so we can all see when we do the change. So we line them up all at the same time. So what we highlighted here is that we're showing that the best performance is what we get as the table showed when we do a late switch from problem two and then trying to solve the combo problem. So switching with this intermediate goal helped us here. So then to go into the conclusions and the future work is that the aim we had here was to expand the boundaries of expectations regarding what is provided to GP for program synthesis. So we wanted to see if we could give GP some kind of head start and if that could improve the performance. And how we did that was that we took program synthesis problem and we presented them as a pair that is similar according to a programming course curriculum in our case. And then we explored transferring information within a single population by solving separate but related programming problems. And what we saw, the, the key findings that we, for, that we saw here was that when we tried the more difficult combo programming problem and used the, uh, the P2 problem as an intermediate goal, it performed better than we used the simpler P1 as an intermediate goal. And when we looked at the initialization of the population, we couldn't really find any clear effects. And what, what we want to look here then for future work and for discussion is that there is no consensus on curriculum learning design for when, when you make your programming course. So of course, if you're a GP designer, there's no set way of how you would set up a good curriculum for your GP either. We also need to, we also should look at different program similarity measures because here we took the similarity according to the course instructor, as in these were the programs given to the student to solve. But there's plenty of research within both education and software engineering for program similarities. And then also the human solution data we had that is that was very limited and it was biased by the amount of diversity available from the solutions to the course. And finally, of course, there, these were only two problems that we look at. So there's plenty of more programming problems out there for us to look at. And please come and visit us in the, in the poster because it's even better because there and Jordan, the, the first author will be there as well. So we can ask answer even more questions. Thank you for your time.